spend the rest of the day walking around the periphery of the campus and let it sink in. Here we are. By the way, what Rachel is doing here is, is working the tape, and uh, we are taping this. Um, I can't, you know, promise having tapes to, to hand out, but uh, if people are interested, they should contact us and, you know, we can eventually get you a tape of the whole symposium. All the artists that we've invited to the panel are actively working and exhibiting. They each have a fair amount of momentum with their work and careers. And uh, beyond that, I won't, I won't go into it. Um, but each of them has been invited here to be on this panel, not only because of the, their currency in the art world, but also because they're known to be effective public speakers and uh, able to articulate something about their own work and its relationship to current discourse. Uh, the question, why paint, is ridiculously simple and potentially obnoxious, but uh, we felt it would be a good hinge point for a range of responses. And, uh, Know, almost like a Zen koan. So the way it's going to work is each of the artists will come up and present their work, uh, respond to that question in any way they feel appropriate for around 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll all gather to the table and sit down and, and have a discussion. Uh, I guess, I don't know what order we're going in, but uh, Alphabetical. Let me find my list. I know Ingrid Kalam is first because that's uh, Ingrid is from LA, lives and works in LA. Michelle Feinstein is based in New York. Fabian Marcaccio is based in New York. Aaron Perizet is based in Houston, Texas. And Amy Silman comes to us from New York. And we'll so we'll start with Ingrid. Thank you.
seven, I guess, because to make them on aluminum. So the, all this, most of the slides are on aluminum. Anyway, uh, so this would be 1994. It's one of the first paintings I made of this series, which is uh, sort of in response. CalArts talks a lot about stuff. And I, I wanted to make the most simple painting I could that was about ab abstraction. But um, so I used these uh, studio stains from my floor, uh, my studio floor. And I began this project, which um, this is, again, these are, I'll, I'll tell you if it's a different size. It's called two foot by two foot. This is, the last one is Love Pups or Pal. This is a Wii U Whoop. Um, and uh, it was just using the same set of stains, which was about 20 stains, and um, organizing them on this, on this square. And I was thinking about the frame. I was thinking about, um, this is Ooh La La Oompa. I was thinking about, um, well, I, I actually wasn't thinking at the beginning. I was just trying to do the simplest thing. But then, uh, as I was going on, I was thinking about it uh, as this, this is the first moment. Then I decided, uh, still the first moment, this is uh, umla. And I was thinking um, about uh, that these all looked like a, um, the first moment of something. So I started, um, well, this is a little soon. Um, I decided to move on to the second moment, since all these compositions were really um, cen centered, and I was sort of laying these tracings of these studio stains on top of the canvas, not canvas, but board. I decided to, um, as in film, keep the frame the same size and increase the, the scale of the, uh, of the event that I was working from, as film does. It, it can represent something that's as small or as large as um, you know, as you have a budget for, or as you have an imagination for. Actually, I was more interested in low-budget films where a terrain is implied by the shadow. Of it. Anyway, you know. Um, so uh, these are the tracings. I started in, uh, in, in extending the size of the event. I decided to um, to combine the, the drips with each other to make more stains. This made uh, uh, what I didn't want because I was interested in abstraction. I decided to be solipsistic and uh, and. <coughs> Uh, so that the indexfulness of what I, you know, of the studio floor became more and more remote as I um, used it as a system to increase the size of the vent. Okay, so that's that's an example of the tracings on the floor in a constellation. Then I started just for myself. I started documenting the constellations uh, uh, so that I could keep track of the constellations and also of the parts, the paintings I was making from them. So, and also in this project, which is titled Schplu, um, the, uh, the, this would be both, of, oh, I should move the scale. This is nine, uh, let's see, this is 13 feet tall by uh, about nine feet wide. And it, it, uh, it is titled Boom uh, Swoop. And it's uh, both the large constellation from which I would take a detail from and also uh, the next, uh, one of the shapes I would combine to make the next uh, constellation. So it was both the beginning and the end. That's why it's solid. Uh, you know, that's why all the, the, the overlappings of the tracings don't uh, occur uh, on this, which is enamel on trace mylar. This is difficult to see. I'll see. Okay. There's another one, it's called Trump. The same scale. This is, um, this is an example of the second moment paintings then, from, taken from constellations. Uh, and it gets really complicated at this point, okay? It gets like, I'll just tell you the title of this one and then the last one of this. So this is called Crack, which is from the, the, the constellation flat, Crack. And then I started naming each of, the, each of the drifts because I was inventing them. It was a way to locate the detail in the hole. So it was, this one's called Crack from the constellation Crack. Okay, Crack, Oik, Big, Splu, Floa, Spoo. Okay. <laughs> This guy, uh, and, and as the second moment, I mean, basically, I could have nothing happen and have the rest of the constellation happen outside of it. But I also started thinking of the blobs as, um, the, the, this actually has about, two, uh, you know, a couple colors of dark, you can't see. Um, uh, this one's PU, PU, constellation is PU, um, orange, squish dish, blob, crip, full, thunk, zoo, crap, boom, 
week. It got really complicated with galleries, but I have, I have, a, I have a, a num numerical indexing system. Uh, this is O, as you do, so yeah, everything's going off. Okay, this is the last one of the series um, from the from details from the Project Blue, and it is uh, called, okay, <coughs> Splatu, uh, no, Splatu, Spibem, Olopo Kump, Wuzul Burbo Uft Oit King, Swoop Push Swishish, Oit Zult R, Low Flow Crops We Shu. I should say, not only was the, the words um, a location device, but also, um, I was interested in how you imagine sound and the viewer coming to the, this image, imagining the, because uh, most people don't say it aloud when they look at the thing. So it was a way of placing the, placing the, uh, the pictures in time and motion. You know, basically I'm trying to articulate motion. Or, you know, it's the difference between film and painting, um, which is part and whole, basically. And we all accept that, and that abstraction is very natural to us, which I find really odd. Basically, my paintings aren't abstract, the world is abstract. And I'm using abstraction as uh, the place to not talk about anything else but abstraction. You know? <laughs> That's how I think of it. You might want to ask me a question about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is called Splunk. Oh, this is in the, the show, so I'll speak though. This is, uh, this, these are all stains from downtown LA. I made a piece for a show and it was, uh, anyway, I just went out into the street and I decided I was ready for the world and I started tracing stains on the street uh, in front of the gallery I was gonna have the show at and made this piece. Um, at the gallery was posted, I think this is an installation there, okay. These are details, you can start to see, it starts to be really different, the, um, the level of detail gets more complex. This is um, uh, Alms Link. Two foot by two foot again. Uh, Moom. Uh, this is an installation of a piece at the drawing center. It's called Um Little Bop. Some more details. It's uh, 24 feet long by 20 feet wide. And what I'm doing here is I'm, and my studio is normal size. I mean, it's like, I don't know you know, much smaller than this room, and I can't see this piece in my studio. I have to work on it in pieces and panels. It's kind of like scrolling, it's manual. Everything I'm doing is um, same, the same, same scale. So I trace the stain from the street. I trace, uh, I make a constellation in my studio, and then I lay the mylar over it, then I paint it on the top of it, then the detail is taken straight from that. So, so it's actually very literal and very, very representational in a way that most things that we consider representational aren't, like photography and, and computer and, and film and everything else changes the scale of things. So in that one element, this is very representational, but uh, uh, as it goes on from constellation to detail, it gets more uh, fanciful, I think, or, or in, in my imagining of what this moment could be. So this is, this is um, used, I'll go quickly. This is Karuncha. Uh, this is, uh, now this, this is, uh, begins the work that's in a show in Cologne right now. Uh, oh so it's, I just finished the work, so it's really hard for me to remember the names. I have to. Okay, this one is Stew Peep. This is, this is because the, the, stu, the street stains are an infinite variety of uh, sizes, I've now ex expanded my details to be larger. This is four foot by four foot, like the one in the show, which is the first one uh, that, of the four foot by four foot. This is a uh, ear. <laughs> this is my favorite. <laughs> this is a uh, own. <laughs> so uh, I stopped using the, the, the uh, I'm not using language anymore to locate it because this is now, basically with this project I'm going both into, before it was just time, a model of time, this is both place and time. You know, okay, because of the place is the street, the moment that I pick up the stains. Okay, this is quick. <laughs> This is two foot by two foot. The rest are two foot by two foot. This is ulb, tooth, uh, girl.
you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, good afternoon, good morning. Um, I, I want to be um, as quick as I can because when the um, invitation came to speak uh, here um, on the occasion of the exhibition uh, and a symposium on white, white paint and abstract painting once removed, um, and I had 10 minutes to talk. I'm using it all up, you can tell I talk a lot. So the 10 minutes really provided a kind of limit for me. And I started thinking that it would be really interesting to do something I normally don't do, which is um, be completely, let myself go aphoristically, and show you slides which are not necessarily my own, but things that I think about. Uh, and I wanted to make some very, very brief introductory remarks that will all be quite concise, I hope. Uh, when, um, right, time me. Um, in relation to once removed, um, the first thing that occurred to me was uh, the way in which the phrase once removed was used um, in my family, generally related to a cousin marrying a cousin. And somebody would say, don't worry, it's once removed. <laughs> so, so that in, 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 in the way in which, well, you get it. Okay, that's why I'm going to keep it. Okay, I'm going to be brief. Okay, the next, the next remark is a quote. And this is all related to painting, by the way, and playing with the limits of painting. Um, second remark, or quote. Uh, and this is from Chekhov. And Chekhov said that all happy families are happy in the same way and all unhappy families are unhappy in different ways. Yeah. I hope I got that right. Uh, the third topic, um, I'm going to introduce myself here. I just want to say that I believe, for me as an artist, that painting is both artifactual and perceptual. And that is both, to me, are very live, living enterprises, experiences. The fourth. Uh, is from Andy Warhol, who I often quote. He is a brilliant writer and gets more and more brilliant uh, as, as I read him more and more deeply. And he said something about leftovers in the philosophy of Andy Warhol. Uh, and he said, I always, work, I always work with leftovers, doing the leftover thing, because there are so many of them. The only bad leftover is the recurring meal. It is a complete meal. So the invention of the leftover is what interested him. Uh, I'm on to the fifth. Okay, fifth is something from a marvelous book. I just um, actually been writing something about architecture and photography, and I'm quite interested in architecture. Uh, and this is from a book written by Robert Hardison, who's an architectural historian. And the book is called The Built, the Unbuilt, and the Unbuildable. And I highly recommend it. Uh, and he has a section on, well, he has many sections on gardens, uh, monuments, ruins, and painting, in fact, there's a chapter on painting, uh, as the unbuildable. And what he says about ruins is, they are ideal. The perceiver's attitudes count so heavily that one is tempted to say that they are a way of seeing. Then I just thought, I don't really want to address why paint, I just want to say what I'm interested in, go right to the slides. Um, I am interested in painting culture, history, institutions, architecture, American movies made between 1930 and 1942, how things are made, why things are made, what's left out, how surplus is used, the reconstruction of it, and by whom, the inappropriate, peripherality, and this is really in order, peripherality, light, color, and space as they occur through peripheral vision and experience. Okay. Um, so this, I'm going to just move to the slides in a moment. Uh, I should say something about my work because you don't know it, and I'm primarily interested in, um, and I'm, I'm going to try to keep this as jargon free as possible, um, grids and squares. You figure it out or ask me later what the difference is. Um, ah, okay, I'm going to just shift it right around here. Um, this is a, a, a piece which is, a, it's, as you can see, it's. Um, actually quite small, it's an important piece, and it's by an uh, Italian artist named Boetti, who I think died in 1992. Uh, I, I put this in uh, with this group uh, because of a variety of things and the way in which it's perceived uh, by me uh, and how many layers that are in the painting in the sense of, of artifact, using language as artifact, uh, material as artifact, um, and it reads, it says, atterare la tensione, and for what it says. And what it says is roughly translated by me is I call attention to myself. And that's, that's the job of 
any good object to call attention to itself. Now, it's very subtle also, um, as well, uh, because the self in this case is both the object and a sense of the narcissistic uh, use of language uh, as real speech. Um, to go on just a little bit, the use of alphabet blocks, as in child's play, the stacking method. Um, they're very uh, graphic, yet uh, they're constructed in such a way um, that the sense of narcissism or self is only possible through a realization of adulthood because a child generally doesn't have that self-consciousness about them. So I could go on and on about them, but I'm going to not. Um, but the, the job of the object does what it says it's going to do, which is why I wanted to bring it up. Uh, this is a painting of mine. I've always been wanting to show uh, this painting somewhere um, at, at one of the locations. It's from a, a group of paintings that I've been doing for the last eight years called The Wonderfuls, which are all tiny paintings. They all have the same, it, the word wonderful is in them, because I don't work um, in a sequence of images. Um, I, I work a lot with well grids and squares and language. And in this case, I wanted to set out to make a, a kind of a conventional, for me, series of paintings. So the word wonderful came up, and it's so big, and, and you know, it's such a big word, and it's overused and cliche and, and so forth. So I was in the country, and here's the sense of, for me, the, you know, the, the artifact, I, I used materials at hand, the surplus. I was in the country one summer, and uh, this painting is called Wonderful Country, and I do have a laser pointer, which I'm going to try and use. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't know that. Okay. All right, I'm happy to show this, because these are all cutouts from, I, I've got the mailbox stuffed with flyers. I'm living in New York, you don't get food advertisements in this way, or supermarkets don't exist in the way they do in the country. So anyway, I made this whole piece called Wonderful Country, and it has a lot of surface and blah, 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 but this is Texas down here. So all the meat became Texas, Maine, blueberries, and so forth. So it's, it's the wonderful country says, I want to use the construction um, of, of painting for me uh, and be able to make it rather than, you know, very kind of reflexive. Okay, I'll keep going. So that's just my little Texas flow. Uh, this is from uh, 1943 uh, in discussion of limits, the limits of the talk, the limits so-called of painting of objects um, this is a, uh, originally a grid, it was an airfield, it was a 1943 photograph uh, done by the Royal Air Force, what was formerly a German airstrip, and it was um, raised over. Uh, so it, the opposition to the grid uh, occurred and made another form. So um, I don't have to say too much more about that. Uh, this is, um, I put in a few works by students, um, because they're working with the limits uh, even more than I am, I think, at this point. Uh, this is a, a young artist by the name of Gerard Manley. I wanted to include it in and, and realize the limits of painting in terms of the literality of edge and image and material. Um, this is a photograph um, of a fascist youth organization organizing themselves. Um, and I forget the photographer, forgive me, it's a really well-known photographer. Um, in any event, uh, the grid formation, I mean, I'm interested in, in all that kind of errant uh, organization of, of people, places, things, paintings, and so forth. And um, this is really a, at a moment, there's a moment of time in this, which is was not just frozen as in a photograph, but it's the meaning, uh, the accumulation of levels from the back plane to the foreground plane, of uh, the person overlooking. Uh, so it's like it has both flatness and depth to it at the same time. Uh, and this is um, the de Kooning Studio, which is another kind of path for a limited space. Um, Lee Bontecu from 1964, um, another particular point of view um, about limits, about utility, about surplus, about joinery, um, about plane. <coughs> and this is from a trip I made to Cuba. Uh, and it's to a place called the Hall of Africa. And it, I thought that it was it, uh, a place uh, where I'd find yeah, actual artifacts. Um, but instead, it turned out to be a collection uh, that of objects that were given to Fidel from uh, USSR satellite, satellite countries. And so the place was filled with things made especially for the kind of modern thinking, progressive program, um, you know, every five years. So in any event, what interested me, of course, was the, the and it looks somewhat like a shelter magazine gone mad. Uh, and, and this was in 93. The, um, the skin itself, and, and this I take as the real material of my painting, um, literal, uh, literally and figuratively speaking, the skin from the animal, which is then um, contemporized 
into a grid format. So what does something like that mean? It's very striking to me. And also, the furniture uh, carved out of casks or drums, uh, and then using very um, kind of modernized forms. Um, the concurrence of things that happen that have nothing to do with each other um, are interesting uh, to me. Uh, this is an Annie Albers study, uh, and at the same time, you can see an Andy Warhol photograph. And these are one of the Polaroids with a flopped seam. Um, these are things that I do use in my work. I collect these things, and um, I don't know when they're going to come together, but sometimes they do, and I think I'm going to show you some of my own work now. Yeah, this is a close-up. That grid in the background, or those bricks in the background, are a scaling up and enlargement um, from the Warhol brick photograph. Um, there are, there's latex on there, there are many, many layers of silk screen with flocking, with non-flocking. Um, and I'll show you the whole piece, it's just a detail of the piece in, in a moment. Uh, but the, that brick was re-photographed many times. I wanted to get many different moments of timing within the painting, making it always flat, and at the same time getting a depth, a perceptual depth, uh, and literally um, a surface, moving across the surface. So, that said, this is the com combined piece. I work a lot in units, uh, and have been, you'll see a couple of slides later uh, how big they've gotten. Um, uh, this is called marriage. Uh, the panel on the right occurred first, and those were all done from uh, printed sheets that were uh, grids that were misprinted, actually. And I'm interested in the accident, the surplus. I buy a lot of surplus, so these were like stacks of note paper that were misprinted. I then glued them onto the canvas. Um, I then started painting the new grid that was laid on just by the you know, need to move across the surface, putting on different viscosities of paint and so forth, then pulling them off wherever there was a line across the metal line, I started pulling that off. So they're really tags, um, literally coming off the painting. The one on the left um, is, I mean, I, I, I don't have to go too deeply into it, but Sean Landers had a show a few years ago. I think this piece is from 95. And uh, I, I loved the show, and I really admired it. He did a terrific uh, piece that was about 20 feet long, all done in pencil of his uh, kind of meandering, kind of um, you know, bad boy, very funny and very serious at the same time, uh, kind of phrases, just little, little tiny things that were kind of laid out in grid units. So I really liked it, and, um, and I thought, well, I want to also, I wanna, I'm going to address some other things as well. So what I started doing was silk screening Sean's talk, and then uh, his conversation on the painting, and then uh, began to really develop my own conversation uh, with Sean and with myself. Um, this is a current piece, so it's pretty new. Um, it has many units. Um, often uh, the titles were, I think a lot about words. I don't necessarily think about language. And I think about when I use words, I normally, I'm not, I'm leaving out a lot of my slides. How am I doing? Well, I'm sorry. Have a minute? All right. Uh, I would normally think of a word as another kind of found element, and the painting as the grammar that made it into a string, you know, that, that, made, that made discussion discourse, dialogue, conversation, possible. Um, now, um, there was some discussion by people generally about my titles. Um, usually they really like them. Um, but in, in terms of the, you know, the unhappy family uh, quote, uh, while unhappy in different ways, um, I really want clarity in my work. And while the words may be clear, um, I wanted to find a way of really operating different timings of you know, different kinds of clarities within the work to work not larger. Um, so I want the intervals to kind of like move through them differently. So I started making paintings out of the titles. Um, so this is um, related to a trip I, I made, and it begins with O Solomio on the left. Uh, and that's uh, April of 1997, the big panel on the left. And I, I was at the American Academy, and they asked me to, what my project was, and I had none. So I said, well, I'm going to collect receipts and make a calendar out of it, which really started this whole project. And, and to make a long story short, everything in there is a little tube that's hanging to the left that the things were shipped back in, and then other receipts in the little box. Then the middle panel is the trip I made onto Germany, which is the one on the right. Uh, the tickets go right across the bottom. I think I have another detail here. And the flag is, it doesn't photograph as green, but it is the German flag. And I'm interested in the way language and painting are part of culture. Um, they have Different, there are different methods of approach, different entries. But I'm using um, the language in that German flag as something that, that I don't know if anybody, anyone read it back there? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, great, so I don't have to repeat it. 
Um, let me go to the detail shot then. That's one detail. Um, these are all the little things, the maps and, and so forth, the, the, the travel. I mostly saw things that were like way below my knees. So I had a lot of maps of, of ruins. I went there because I was interested in architecture, in fact, and mostly fascist architecture, but I ended up looking more at other Augustine you know, ruins. Uh, that's one detail. This is uh, Ishmael on Berliner. This is a Warhol uh, ground again. These are attached onto the surface, the train tickets on the left. Uh, and, and my general feeling is that on the way uh, to Germany, certainly that's a joke because it means I, you know, I, I, I am a, what is it, a jelly donut or something, it's what it actually means. So there, you know, the, the, the word, like the wonderful is that I did, um, the, the words themselves don't exactly mean what you think they mean. Um, and this is uh, just the other piece. Uh, this is a relatively new piece. It's called um, Before and After, and it's, it's grown since I've taken this slide. There are now nine elements in it. Uh, but in looking around, uh, after that trip uh, to Europe, I decided I wanted to try and make work that led in as much as possible uh, from my own experience and just kind of um, you know, fly by the seat of my pants. So this piece is expanded, but um, it really is a sense of a, you know, a painting rack and a painting of a painting uh, waiting to be made that is a painting. Um, and uh, this is, uh, again, the use of language. This is uh, my. Uh, I guess self-portrait, one of the wonderful, and it's just Rochelle, Illinois, which is a found label on a skein of yarn. And it's, it's really the, kind of the square of the grid, is my house. Um, and uh, this is something also by a student, and I brought it along because this is really what we do. It's art in the dark, and, and whether you're in or in this kind of situation. And this is also by a, a young artist named Ellie Pyle. Uh, this isn't the only thing she does. However, it's a portrait that she made uh, it was all made out of gaffer's tape and duct tape, uh, and so the surface of it is very flat. So it's always flattening out. The way the screen goes right to the edge of the piece really is it's like a trip to nowhere. It's sort of, a, to me, a little bit of a, a, a third generation rock, like Robert Moskowitz, with us, if anybody remembers those big horizontal pieces he did of tra road travel. In any event, this is actually a portrait of Carol Dunham showing his slides. <laughs> so, um, and then this is, um, again, this is something from me. And, and I, I think I uh, managed to not use, which is now my new model of not using the word abstract in a talk. I think I made it. Uh, and I'm using um, parts of words right now. And I'm, I'm separating them. And I'm interested in this kind of odd bubble format, uh, both as a rigid, uh, a rigid element, as a kind of decorative element, uh, and so on. And that's the end. Thank you. section or kind of modernist ideas actually, but in my case, uh, in my way of thinking actually, it has been always about reconnection and about multiple ways of making the world connective actually, like try to make painting as much as connective as possible, as a sort of a connective tissue uh, with all kinds of sources actually. Uh, and of course painting is, you know, started, um, started uh, 
they still look like paintings actually. And I'm really important, I thought to me that's really important because uh, most of art don't look like art. And I think that uh, there is something interesting about uh, looking like art. I mean, there's something uh, somehow frivolous actually. Uh, I would say that actually most of the ready made, all the, the sets of the ready made, if we read all the crises of the ready made, let's say from the Champion ready made, is the first person who somehow keep painting out, uh, we can see actually that ready may become a cultural ready made right now. It's not the object actually, but the whole culture, the corporations, uh, everything works like a ready made right now. Uh, or like, you know, other concepts actually that came from abstraction, like sometimes I, I do some bites, like I say, okay, uh, all over, McDonald's all over the world. Uh, serial painting, serial killers. Uh, and so on. So you can somehow, instead of actually get, you know, go, you know, reductivist, actually, you can create almost like a micromalism somehow out of painting. And really use actually this, you know, the, the kitschy side of painting, the analytical side of painting, the gross side of painting. Actually, um, Genesis is something really interesting about, uh, you know, the, the situation of the bacon actually didn't do sham somehow. And somehow he didn't actually connect, I mean, he, he makes, uh, he, uh, he could actually paint because he didn't pay attention to Duchamp. And those were two points that actually I started with, actually. I was always interested about how decadent and stupid Bacon was, and, and how stupid and how Duchamp uh, was, too, in, in all these uh, ways to, to go. But at the same time, how sophisticated. I mean, I was trying to do, uh, to do an effort to actually think that something could be extremely stupid uh, at the same time could be extremely analytical. So that's actually a path of the world. But like, question, this piece is one of the first pieces, and uh, it's like a, it's actually, it, mo all my work is actually integration between different elements that are coming from pictorial uh, elements to photographic elements to, uh, you know, sculptural elements. So everything that you're going to see is actually uh, 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 in a sense of integration. It's not painting about photography or painting a, or photography about painting or, or sculptorialized painting, but it's actually a match. I don't believe anymore in actually uh, difference. I, I believe that you can just uh, play and intensify actually the, the, how actually these different things merge. And this was actually like a, it was almost like a rhyme to me, but it was like a pornographic rhyme. There was a, there was this. Um, up there in the, that kind of bridge thing that you see there, you see. there. That is uh, like a pornographic material actually that was injected inside the brush mark that is actually holding the frame that is somehow distorted like a robot painting somehow. And it holds actually the, the canvas together. So I was really interested in, in thinking about all this uh, relation between structure and superstructure. And what is really you know, important in the painting, what is structural, and actually what is uh, uh, super structural. So that was um, okay. This was a, a kind of like a, another kind of this painting, like from '91, '92, somehow, and it was uh, the part of an exhibition that was called the Alter Genetics of Painting. And I was actually interested in actually the type of new type of determinism that we have. I mean, we used to have a let's say a pragmatic determinism. <coughs> Uh, influenced by you know, pragmatic philosophy, and, and then we went through the highly psychoanalytical type of uh, reading of the world, and now we all end up in biological determinism. So I wanted to actually write the reading of the night, try to think about this relation of how you know, biologic, uh, uh, biology is, is actually altered by biogenetics, and how actually painting could actually create a model, a parallel, or a resonance to that. So the paintings and how went from the world to the structure, and it all end up in that kind of funny connection into the drippings there. there. So it was like a, it will be a painting with a, with a superstructural material getting to an, an umbilical core. It was extremely stupid too. That's, that was you know, a really valuable <coughs> thing to me. To do some, a painting that will be extremely outrageous and like somehow, you know, that, that, that's another case actually. He had his leg. I mean, it's, a, it's such a shame. <laughs> that's the feeling that the painting is actually making up in front of you somehow. That is, it's making it's itself up. And it's not really about subjectivity coming from the art. It's more actually a sense of, uh, you know, 
being alive, really, a sense of kind of, uh, I always believe in a sort of injecting some kind of uh, life force that will actually not be kind of, uh, let's say, uh, try to make the painting look like human, actually, but somehow inject a kind of, a kind of uh, you know, uh, life force into the painting that will run the whole program of the painting. <coughs> another little bigger painting. Um, and there's all kinds of things, of course you can read in catalogs, you know, these things that are, that are my, my way of actually creating like a cartographical situation where I work and you know, really, you know, possess a whole type of formal activities because I believe in a lot of ideas that are actually related to a, a situation beyond formalism, actually. Not rejecting for, formalism like the easy way that how many people try to, you know, get rid of formalism, but actually trying to go through and to find a hole within formalism into, into a situation that I call transformalism, or sometimes I call it a new type of informal type of work. But it's not informalism, but actually it's like about information and about the process of form that develop in the painting, like a kind of movie somehow. Uh, that's something really important to me. That's upside down. Look at that. Yeah. Some old <laughs> yeah. That is actually an important thing to me, the situation of animation into the world. Uh, I, sometimes I, I see the pictures as sort of like pictures of um, like a, some type of impossible pictorial activity going on. Uh, and I always find that interesting that Duchamp actually lived painting, and that's one of the more uh, enigmatic way of how he lived painting because he thought it was an impossible thing to do. And the big glass have a lot to do with that kind of impossibility of making painting, but I think that you can run paintings that are impossible, basically. And, and you know, these paintings are basically impossible. They're not happening in real gravity. You know, they are not bounded. They are half, print, half printed, half painted. So they are like conjectures on painting. So in that way, the level of rhetorics are uh, lower, and I think in that way more democratic, like David Hickey would say. Okay, this is another monster. <laughs> uh, this is my, my new pieces that I call actually, um, I don't know, like three years ago, I started with this uh, series that are 10, uh, I call it 10 paintings, or paintings. You know, before I, I actually will, I was trying to find a world that would be a little bit different than painting, but actually still having the roots of painting. And I came up with a way of uh, merging the word painting with mutant or replicant. So it would show this kind of whoop, this kind of uh, pictorial activity in, 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 in some sense of motion. That will not be like a futurist in motion or cubist motion or collage, you know, break of pieces motion, but a kind of continuous motion where this uh, the whole piece is run in that way. It's not that the piece will move somehow, but it will create these smooth transitions that uh, will present this uh, sense of a scale and topographical things. The pieces are actually coming pretty much into the dimension of the space. Uh, they are basically made of banner canvas, all kinds of material, plastics, a lot of stuff, synthetic stuff, and, and then they hang like tents, basically, of owning structure, followed by uh, metal pipes, actually. So, and they all bring these uh, situations of uh, the abstracts, that I call it, like uh, how, you know, materials that are photographic, that are indexical, that are materials that are actually iconographic from painting, and, and they actually merge in this uh, uh, sign, icon, uh, symbol, uh, sign kind of me melt. And so there's a growth somehow of, uh, of uh, a abstraction that I call total extroverted abstraction, toward abstraction that are totally introverted. This is another big piece where you can see actually the whole structure playing around on the side, and then the whole, you know, again, the structure, superstructure thing going on. Um, another piece that is, you know, working with all this cartographical material. <coughs> this is actually a really small piece that works actually with this kind of uh, way of uh, organic material, you know, canvas fibers, textual type of signs. So I try to emphasize actually the passage between these things. This is another painting on paper, actually, where you see this sort of almost like a, 
it almost looked like a still life, like a work in the, in the re, uh, remains, or like somehow the resonances of a still life, actually. But the same it's an abstract painting, but it's not, it could be like a rock or a kind of poster of a movie, or a battle of advertising that somebody left behind, or a, a scientific, uh, biological growth, or, you know, some kind of thing that uh, works, it talks in different levels, in a way, uh, and that's actually, something that, uh, that really makes me really interested. Well, this is a more three-dimensional piece that comes from the wall to the, to the floor, and it's called paint and environmental, uh, environmental paint, actually. And, and uh, he, you know, he shows all this kind of, um, I, I have a feeling that a flat painting and like panel paintings have been extremely explored, and 60s, actually, the 60s develop, uh, and the 70s develop some interesting relations about how painting could actually be specific in the space, like, it, like presenting itself and then trying to represent it. And I thought that it's an interesting uh, area to actually work much more, especially the fact that uh, our century was somehow the, the, time, the, the century of space, and now we are going through a, a century about time. And, uh, and I try to be uh, working with these uh, categories where how the, the spectator will actually work, around the piece and I will see the piece through actually. This is another angle of that piece, just like a snake. And then this is the last piece that I show that is this painting that was in Cologne that was a paint and environment too where it comes from the street uh, in a kind of sign sort of uh, a, a looking thing. It looked like a sign, really extroverted kind of painting coming from, from the street and it goes inside to a really introverted kind of thing. So the emphasis actually in the walking through, I mean, seeing, seeing the piece and actually finding the different passages of the pieces and making the whole piece happen. Mm -hmm. So big people will actually go back and forth seeing this thing. So it would, and it's sort of been a painting as a, a, that deals with the, the reminiscence of a window, that it was a painting that went through the window. So it was exciting. But then you can see it far away, uh, and you can see how he acts almost like a sign of an incongruous kind of nature. And then as, you know, as he goes inside the space, he becomes more sensible to a, to a less street look, you know, from communal gesture to a more uh, quiet and uh, introverted gesture. That's about it. Change the reading of it, I guess. Um, 
so, and also became a measure of humor too, and at the same time addressing uh, particular things that I'm interested in in regard to painting. The first painting, the idea of being in an emotional state that then somehow is transferred to the painting. This painting uh, addressing in a very literal way the the idea of being fearful and the notion of a painting that a painting could possibly be a mistake uh, that I don't I don't know how that would be possible necessarily it just is in a way. Another one addressing a uh, particular particular significant historical event without much referent to that. Uh, in the last one in this series, there were perhaps there were ten paintings in the series. Uh, yeah, the difficulty of talking about things. Yeah. Um, ten paintings in the series, a number of other drawings I collected, you know, hundreds of the quotes and whatnot. It, all, all along making the paintings, though, there's a, a sort of premium placed on how the paintings were being made. I wasn't just making sort of one-off geometric abstract patterns, but rather painting them very carefully by hand. The stripe painting, everything is painted by hand. There's nothing taped. And so I take a continuing interest in that, in how the, uh, the surface of the painting gets looked at, that it, I'm making them not just to be not just to be images, but rather to be surfaces that would be seen and to some degree experienced from the distance that I paint them at. So this is all, all the text is hand painted as were the, the patterns, those paintings that had them. And I decided for the next series to try to make that the focus of the painting, that it would be to, uh, the surfaces would be to look at, the image would be, would be empty, ideally. And so I chose to, uh, appropriate wallpaper patterns uh, that are blown up, the colors are adjusted to some degree. Uh, and my idea being that, that wallpaper is something that doesn't, uh, we, we don't look to for meaning necessarily, or image significance or narrative, but rather it's used to fill space and so that there would be, it would be a banal image experience and therefore pull you into the painting and ask you to look at how it was put together. Uh, the color being reductive and, and mostly tinted color is a way to sort of play down the optical effects. And these are, uh, just incidentally, I'm going to use the titles of the wallpaper. So this is Meadow Dance. Uh, the, this is young, young and Fanciful. <laughs> detail of the painting. So initially I would build up the surface and then uh, project the wallpaper, draw it out, and paint it sort of repetitively over and over. I, in doing this, in, in the, uh, the idea of removing the image significance or, or, or eschewing the idea of using uh, significant images, I realized that some of the paintings, that, that there was the wallpaper that I was picking, that I was picking based on the sort of personal preference as well as the ability to paint it in a sort of hard edge fashion uh, was of a particular sort, uh, low brow, children's rooms, whatever it was, and that that uh, that that did have it did have a, a particular meaning, as well as some of the paintings were operating in more interesting ways than others, and I can only assign that to how the the image was working within the painting, and so. Like this one working on a grid on point as well as the lowbrow import. So I wanted to make, I wanted to bring the image question back into it. And so I just, I thought that I would make my own patterns, went in search of things that I would sort of compose patterns that again I could paint. Mm -hmm. uh, and found, uh, uh, looking at the art store in the clip art section, found a clip art book of what are known as attention getters, splashes and burrs, things that you cut out and stick up in the top of your memo to get someone's attention. And thought that the way that uh, the, that being images of sort of flying liquid like paint is, gestural painting and whatnot, that this would be a good way to, to 
good imagery to construct abstract paintings with while, while being from a, a somewhat a, a self-aware or self-conscious place and doing that. that the, the paintings, when they were put together, they wouldn't look like straight abstract paintings, but rather be it. Some remove, I would have, there, there would be a distancing uh, in treating abstraction as an image uh, and with like, <coughs> self-awareness. And so these, I would use the clip art to compose small drawings. When I got the drawing, the, the drawing was at a sufficient state. Project it large, the size that would be painted. Both the last painting and this one are approximately six foot square. Make a few adjustments to it, uh, to the composition once I got it up to that scale, and then start trying to work out the color in a way that painters are want to do in their studios. And the process is one of you know putting the color on and putting the color on and then adjusting things as they go. The color being highly interactive and. Uh, and every addition of any color changing the others and whatnot. So there, when the paintings again, when one walks up to them and looks at them from the distance they've been made at, uh, there's a sort of history between each of the shapes of colors that uh, were previously occupied those spaces. Uh, these, the titles, for the titles of this series I use uh, appropriated titles from uh, first generation Abex painters. This being, not remembering the artist exactly, but this is Horizon Light. Uh, this is a detail actually, so you can see how the colors, the things come up in between the shapes, sort of cleft there. Um, this is actually painting 1951 as a title. But I, I guess I, uh, I'm sort of turned on by the, the graphic quality of the painting now, the, the, the pumped up color and the, the opposition between that and the way that they're painted, that the paintings themselves are, are quite loud, I think, and forceful. And the, the other end of the experience, walking up to them and looking at them as a, a surface and an object, uh, is quiet. You know, they're done uh, carefully and they whisper in opposition to the Loud graphics. Uh, Chief. The titles I, I wanted to have. I was thinking that I would I would harness some of the poetry and the sincerity that was present in the title of those paintings. That they were curious to me that they, uh, as believable and sincere titles, and I wanted to sort of pull some of that forward. And this is first. Personage in yellow ochre and white, with yellow ochre and white, and that's all. Um, <laughs> I have a different, I have a different relationship to, um, I have a different relationship to imagery than uh, some than the other people um, who have spoken um, to some extent and to greater and lesser extent. And uh, I actually decided to do an experiment as well. I decided to only show details. My paintings are very complicated, um, dense and uh, layered paintings. Um, not often. Uh, not often uh, clear, like the number of layers are not often clear. Finally, I end up with sometimes an almost minimal structure. Um, I, um, other times, it's sort of a woven tapestry of lots of things overlaying each other. But um, I just wanted to try something weird, so I decided to take. I've always taken detailed shots. My paintings are, you know, four or five or six feet um, large, and these images are quite small. Um, maybe the scale of like Indian kind of painting from which I drew, derived a lot of inspiration. Um, I'm interested in uh, film, experimental film, um, tantric painting, Indian, other Indian traditions of painting, and uh, uh, narrative. 
essentially, and uh, try to kind of create an affective, um, quite sincere, straightforward, emotional um, uh, sort of index of languages and signs and, and, uh, and imagery. Um, as they combine, I think they end up becoming abstract paintings, but I just wanted to see what would happen if I did um, show you just tiny details blown up. And I guess if you want to see the whole thing, you have to see it in New York. But um, I also thought it would be sort of um, helpful if I sort of went through it in a, as, a, as a sort of an index. So the first set are people. Um, that's my mom. <laughs> that's my me. So, I don't know who that is. That's some horror figure from my family. That's it is so stupid to say what they are, but these are these are single people that sort of um, exist in little bitty corners of my paintings. Um, I mean, I'm just, that's a very small figure on a huge sort of sublime landscape, looking at Lake Michigan. That's a hermaphroditic, um, holy man or woman <coughs> trying to get a pair. That's my parents. It's everybody from the New York, every woman who was in the New York Times on one day made to be frowning instead of smiling. <laughs> Those are Miss Universe contestants who are always smiling. That's a um, crowd of Hindu-like deities gazing down at actually the little figure who's staring up at them standing on the shore of Lake Michigan. This is everyone I used to work with at Bennington transformed into a bug. <laughs> <laughs> That's a comical man with an udder and a sort of self-portrait trying to keep my head above water. Um, marriage proposal. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. Um, we had a whole long, I had a whole section of birds. There was people. Now there's a sort of set of elephants. These are fearful elephants trying to get onto their podiums. Ah, this is um, this is a uh, transforming vegetable person with sexual fears and shame, um, lumbering around in a field of stacked up imagery with tantric stuff and uh, comical. French 17th century cartoon, kind of making a chance meeting. Two devils, crying radishes in the mandala. Um, prettiness becomes grotesquerie and then ends as a dog being beaten with a stick, plus a mandala. A bunch of people going to the right. <laughs> um, the head of an ex-boyfriend that's been swept in through into a whirlwind coming from the body of an ex-girlfriend forming a maelstrom, which is a snowball which sits on the landscape. Um, everyone I've ever been lovers with or is in my family inside a Christmas tree, all frowning. <laughs> Um, everyone I know, plus my dog inside of a tree, which is a bush, which has a radiant um, um, center, which is also an anus, and a landscape with a sad um, wreath trailing along the ground. Mind you, these are just tiny details. This is a song by Dolly Parton, taken apart and indexed alphabetically. Every word is I will always love you. That's um, someone saying an ocean. Or, um, ha or rumors hemorrhaging in Washington after the disclosures of Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> um, that's me as a lonely fir tree on the lake of on the shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, um, the moon, two moons, three moons, a book, a locket, a space inside of an ocean. Um, a set of words which I invented, which are um, neither my mother nor my father, the bad things have both combined into me, which is, can't be said to be bad, because you can't be clumbos, compurial, or glistic, but you might be clumsy and verbose, or your parents might be, so you'll end up being clumbos, but it's not really a bad thing. <laughs> oh, that's it. Um, those are all of my slides. Um, I think I have a few minutes. I, 
I guess, uh, let's see, let's go back to that while I um, just say a few things. Um, I guess I'm really um, I'm interested in contradictions and provocations and uh, textual and pictorial structures interweaving, infecting each other, fucking up, and uh, ending up organizing themselves into some sort of, as Rochelle so eloquently put, an errant system or errant organization. Um, and I have a, therefore, a different relationship to um, pictorial structures than I think than the other people in the uh, in this um, presentation. But I wanted to just um, sort of um, really quickly read two things um, that I feel like have bearing on this work, um, which you can't see because you didn't. You only got little bitty parts. Uh, but this has to do with this is W. J. T. Mitchell in a book called. Um, iconology, writing about the um, sort of protracted struggle between the image and the language. The history of culture is in part the story of a protracted struggle for dominance between pictorial and linguistic signs, each claiming for itself certain proprietary rights or a nature to which only it has access. Among the most interesting and complex versions of this struggle is what might be called the relationship of subversion in which language or imagery looks into its own heart and finds lurking there its opposite number. <clears throat> and then my other quote um, is Richard Foreman, consider a use of the word writing which might be looking or thinking. Um, uh, I don't really know if I have anything else to say. <laughs> Okay. 
I'd like to answer, uh, for me, um, two things come to mind. First of all, I'm, I'm an art critic as well as an artist and working in the film industry. So, I mean, I don't work in the film industry now, but, you know. uh, As an art critic, looking at people's art gave me a lot of faith in the whole process of making things and uh, that, that it is communicative from a visual or contextual point of view. I mean, there's all these sides. I remember being afraid to start to write I was called to make one of you or do something, and I, and, uh, I thought, well, I, I couldn't believe I was scared to write about artwork when I had studied, you know, I was like, if you can't write about art now, <laughs> you know, when can you? So, and then uh, in terms of the film industry, I'd like to say that it completely put uh, the, this art world question into perspective because you know, as an artist, you have so much freedom. You don't have corporate sponsorship. You don't have a producer. You don't have, you know, it's not, not millions of dollars for each question you do. So for me, that put it into perspective of like, well, I'm the boss. I'm the director. I'm the producer. I'm, the, you know, I'm everything. And I think that's a real opportunity that most people in a lot of jobs and in a lot of the industries don't have. So who cares? Uh, that's my feeling is, uh, I, I mean, who cares in terms of, why paint, uh, you, it, it's, you can't explain it. It's just, you know, I mean, again, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a scab or like love. It's like you can't, uh, <laughs> well, it, there's, with, with, in terms of the, my work particularly is like a scab that you, uh, I can't stop picking at it, but people say, isn't that incredibly boring because it's very labor intensive on my knees and, and, and it's like a scab, uh, it's in completely engrossing because there's a question behind it. And I think that's how scabs are. Scabs, you know, basically are part of your body, but you want to see the inside of it, right? So you're thinking at it until it's off, and then you can't see anything and it goes you know, away. But, uh, and like love, in terms of, you can really never explain why you love anybody. I mean, even if, even if there are good reasons, it's usually not why you love them. <laughs> I, was, I just wanted to go back to the question of the art world that you posed. Didn't you sort of pose a question about the art world? Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think that it's really important for everybody to remember that the art world is, is huge, you know, and, and since, you know, we all work in big cities and know people, it isn't in any way bounded by um, what is in the museum, what is um, written about, or necessarily what is seen, because you all, everyone knows people who are, who's, who are, who are who's const all kinds of people are constantly doing work which is not being seen as much or written about or talked about, and yet it goes on. So the art world is, is it's kind of a complicated subject in itself, um, because it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a warped sort of media, Worked media perspective to what we mean when we say the other world. Um, I just want to, um, I guess, make a few comments about that question. I, I, I do really agree um, with Amy and, and Ingrid, and <coughs> I understand the sense of the scale. But a couple of years ago, I actually did a painting called Pick, 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 <laughs> which was really about this process of making making a painting related to. You know, not even understanding. You want to look below, for one thing. Secondly, um, I, I I agree with, with Amy. There are many different art worlds, and I think that one of the uh, distinctions that I would like to make is I, I can't always choose what art world I'm in. Uh, I can't choose to be in, in one or the other, but I can I can you know, create an orbit, uh, you know uh, of my own. But I, I on that just to extend that a little bit. Um, I don't have to like the art world. I don't have to like that institution. I can choose to see that institution uh, in a way which is using painting rather than ignoring it. And that one of one of the big uh, alarms by like uh, like yellow lights go off, um, like at the uh, the biennial a couple of years ago. Yeah, everybody just was rumored it was going to be all about painting. And I thought, oh great, that'll be the last time. And 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 so on. So I mean, I do wonder when the question will be like in three years. You know, why video? Or my installation. So maybe we'll all sort of be on, on you know, the acknowledgement that there are different artworks and the practices get accepted, rejected, and reconsidered all the time. I want to add something because I think that 
uh, I think your question has something to do, I mean, of course you can say as an artist, you can say all kinds of things, but, I, you know, somebody a while ago told me that, uh, it was sort of funny line, it says that um, the 70s was the time for artists, I say, it was good to be an artist, and how the, the 80s was the gallery, <coughs> the best thing was actually to be, the, the more aureatic place was to be um, a gallerist, and the 90s more a curator thing, I mean, the curators are becoming like producers in a way. And we actually, as artists, we actually work for their ideas, basically. Most of the international shows are actually around an idea, and then there are the nationals coming from one side, that are the typical names, and then they are like the ones who, uh, you know, basically uh, illustrate the ideas in a better way. And, and I think we're going to the next century into a sort of like a producer kind of, you know, like even a more complicated kind of. It's actually more from the artist to gallery to, um, you know, uh, to curate, to sort of producer of art in a way. And the sad thing is that we're going closer and closer to, inter to the, the, to the um, in, um, uh, entertainment industry, basically. There's a model that is, is unbelievable hype, but it's so sad in a way. I mean, it's like, the, the, the nicest thing is that when you go to a museum at least, or whatever, you are in contact with art, you will have actually something rather than what you have in the television every day. Because you have that anyway, so you, I mean, you don't need to have the same trash in, in a gallery or in other places. So it's, it's, it's kind of sad that, you know, I would say like in the work of uh, Damien Hertz is actually one of the most typical cases of that kind of, and maybe he will be a curator or a whatever, a filmmaker in the future. So there is a political, um, let's say, progression to that. So, you know, that's why painting, I mean, you know, People don't have so much patience for painting because it's, uh, it's too much like poetry, like actually uh, the journey says actually before. I mean, who's got to have the, the, the patience to actually? <laughs> it's not that it's not good, but it's like how in, you really inscribe into the culture. Like, who have time? Can, can I just say one thing to that? I mean, I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it's actually um, what you're saying is really important to consider and because who are the curators? becomes the really important question. You know, possibly who were the writers and the curators in the past, who are the curators and the writers now, who do form this very important um, sort of leadership of what we see and what is institutionally acceptable. Um, and then therefore what becomes a critique, you know, is also fashioned around those people. So it should be it should be considered uh, uh, an area of critical culture to critique curatorial um, thing, you know, stuff. <laughs> have, you ever, have any of you ever made a work in response to an exhibition or something like that? What? Or like a, as a critique? Or a, as a bouncing off? One, well, one idea I was going to ask is have you ever painted it in response to other paintings rather than in response to pressure from the art world or what's in the magazine or what people are talking about? Well, I, I don't really, I don't, I can, I can uh, maybe address that a little bit. I don't, I don't ever paint under pressure from the art world. I mean, the pressure comes from the painting. But I, I want to like, anyway, I'm belaboring now because I want to go back to this and continue this point related to that in terms of um, reacting to like, you know, a, a project idea perhaps, and I can kind of expand that question of yours. I can give you a concrete example of something very recent uh, that's actually the current. Um, and and uh, somebody has proposed an exhibition of a portrait show. Uh, and just follow up on that thing. Except the, um, it's been in discussion for a while, and um, it's just like you know, basically a portrait show. But it's not high concept <coughs> enough as a painting show. So this person who's curating it was told to go out and get a higher concept. So I talked to the person and I said, well, okay, you do me, I do you makes it very sexy, very high profile. I can see the critical response to it now, formally, you know, intimate sense of portraiture um, has now become really about what we're, we normally call the fantasy thought. So that would, be the, that would be the high concept thing. But it would just be a good old portraiture. So, um, no, I would never make a painting in response to something that I didn't really, you know, if somebody said, do a, do a painting for this, no. I mean, and I don't think the pressure, I don't know if I'm even answering your question, but I really wanted to go from there. there, there. <laughs> I think everything... I guess what I'm, the point that I wanted to make, or maybe you can respond to this idea, can painting be done in the vacuum now, 
or has it ever been? Vacuum. Or, or where? It's never like that. Yeah. 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 I mean, like a open thing about me, like I get a bitch that work, and get a bitch to work, look like all contestations to some kind of thing that happened before. But there are positive, positive like there are positive answers. In a way. Like, who will say that, uh, let's say, I don't know, modern Kunz from Polka is not an interesting painting? Uh, because it's, I mean, such an uh, unbelievable painting, the relation to modernism and what he did and everything. But, you know, it's, it's so great anyway. I mean, there's a lot of answers, you know, like paintings that probably have answers alone and that they're sad in a way. But I, in my case, actually, I run away a little bit from those kinds of I mean, if there is something that that would be on top of me, let's say, uh, something that would be asked for me, I would just run away. And it happened actually, the first painting that I show actually, I started in 90, no, no, I mean, 80, 88, something to making these uh, pornographic kind of things. And, and then, because I was really interested about pornography as a social work, in a way, like a so, you know, social warfare at that level, and in relation to how it worked with the structures of the painting and the beauty, you know, this kind of stuff, uh, like corruption, in a way. That I think is one of the more important parts of our society. And uh, all of a sudden, the whole body art thing started pumping around. I said, oh my god, I would be trapped with this kind of body art thing. So I kind of ran away from that. So I was conscious of doing that, actually. I feel really oppressed by all that simple anthropological type of uh, revival, all that type of stuff. I just want, I wanted to say something about vacuum. I mean, I'm not really sure what you mean by vacuum. Like, the artwork is sort of a vacuum. You know, I make my paintings, you know, uh, I mean, the whole question of what a vacuum is is kind of crucial to, you know, to sort of elaborate on if you even ask the question. I'm not even sure mm -hmm. that we understand how to answer that. If you mean outside the art world, that's not a vacuum. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, what I meant was that you were painting in a, at a point in time in a system, and also point painting from what you want. And so I'm curious about people who are people's um, finding that balance, finding the balance of what you want to paint and the series of frames in which it will be viewed within and from. I think everybody paints what they want to paint. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think um, that uh, in terms of uh, yeah, I have trouble with the idea of a vacuum. Maybe you've thrown us off the rail or something with the word because because but because culture has so much imagery now that anything. I mean, there's no vacuum to be found in a way. You know, I think uh, culture of course. Thing, I, yeah, the thing. Yeah. <laughs> something that I always wonder about. Well, something all my pets hate. Vacuum. <laughs> 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 I, I find actually this idea of a vacuum. I don't know. I don't think the art world's really a vacuum either. Because, like in New York, don't you think it's, it's, it's more like that stupid machine that they invade naturally? That's a blower. <laughs> that actually instead of <laughs> sucking, it <laughs> blows. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
And so it's just a question of how things assimilate into that system, not that there's also a Westheimer Art Street Festival. Sorry, I, think I totally disagree with you. Yeah. Yes, um, I think you're misreading um, okay. a good deal. And um, I don't know about the Westheimer Art Festival, I don't know about the Washington Square, or what I think, I assume from the name that that's really what you're talking about. Um, when I talk about different art worlds, I'm talking about something which even within our small little regionalism in New York, which is now, you know, become, New York is like a, you know, another place on the international map. Uh, you know, which you know, maybe even Houston will be. Uh, but within that world of New York, and when I say I can either, I can make my own decisions about institutions. First, I think you're making assumptions about what things look like in magazines as opposed to what they really are. Um, you're doing a consensus of style, and this is the one thing I really object to um, in terms of uh, saying that everything is in a magazine is like everything in a magazine, because that's not the case. Uh, the magazine is an, an instance of an art world, yet there are other publications, there are other communities, and I'm talking about real communities that do meet, like Four Walls, for example, which has been like a non-magazine, non-venue way for artists to actually form communities. I think to the question of the vacuum, um, the one thing that I, I really do want to say about that is that I, I, I feel like, and I, one of the things I wanted to open my statement with is that I'm not here as an apologist. And, and I think very crucially, the thing that Jeremy was referring to, in large part, were the uh, kind of the Greenberg, the, the endless repetition of Greenbergian attacks, as if art, we have to now admit that, no, yes, that art was in a vacuum, but we're not, as if we have to defend this position. And I think that art has never been in a vacuum. It may not have been in a place that people can accept it was in. And I don't know contextually what that art world at that time was really like, because there were many art worlds even during the days of color field painting. So I think that the vacuum uh, is one of a presumed um, uh, an acceptance of this discourse of modernism. And I don't necessarily agree with it. Well, I don't think there's any vacuum, and I was using magazines as a metaphor for a system that all of the work that was shown today addresses itself to you and is aware of when they're in the studio. We're not painting in how? the studio back in Tell me how. How does it address itself? Yeah, the work you saw today, including your own. How? <laughs> It's, well, I, I, I would have felt that I explained my own in that way, that it's aware of, of a context, and that context can't be shut out of the studio, and I see that never comes to work as well. Can I, can I, I just explain? Can I, can, I, can I respond yeah, to your question? Sure. I just, um, I don't, you know, I want to just uh, give an example. I think everybody has their own, it's like my own private Idaho. I think everybody has their own private art history. Mm -hmm. And what I, I'm trying to say, um, I, I, I agree with Rochelle, but I also want to say it more, per, you know, my own sort of personal way, which is that, for instance, um, a, a moment of real uh, awareness or quickening for me was when I saw this 1949 film of Kenneth Anger called. Uh, uh, help me out here. No, no, no. Way before that. Um. Anyway, it's the one where it starts off with spangly dresses being fluttered in front of the camera, and. Um, it, it, it blew my mind. It was made, you know, in 49, and it had to do with sex, fascism, politics, allure, glamour, beauty, uh, opium, sensuality, and, and, and everything. And it had to do with it in a way that the art world of the time had no, had, had no notion of. It was, it was synced up with something which, of course, does later come under the map, the redrawn map, or the sort of macro view of, like, cultural production in the late 20th century. So it had some relationship to other things, but it hadn't been fleshed out. Um, uh, it hadn't, it, its dialogue and the dialogue of early experimental film still has not yet quite been synced up with the video um, dialogue. And, and yet they're coming closer and closer together. So video makers now in galleries don't necessarily know of the work of 40 years worth of <coughs> experimental filmmakers who will not put their work on video because they don't believe in video. And yet their aims, their, their, their aesthetics, and their purposes, their intentions, is very close to what is being done, done now in some parts of the art world. So when I say, you know, what art world, what I mean is that, like, even within what we generally think of as being written about or thought about, there are these 
there are these, um, you know, there's stuff going on in Harlem, there's stuff going on in the film world, there's stuff going on in San Francisco. I just found out about Walsh Berman. I didn't even know he existed. And he's right up my alley. You know, so, you know, when I, I feel like I'm, I'm not addressing the very small community that, that, that has anything to do with maybe who you feel like you're addressing or who she feels like she's addressing or, you know, do you understand what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, I can see there are other there are other communities outside of this one. They're saying that this is this is the context that this work is presented in, and it looks mindful. I think there's a, there's kind of a I think just a, my response to it, but I there's a shift in power that I I feel like I've made, and I and uh, that I that I. Uh, to do with, you, you sort of can't follow the art world. If you start following the art world, it's over, I mean, it's over before it's begun. So if you start following it, you know, what's fashionable, then you're too late always. And you can, I mean, there's a lot of people who I've been around at like openings and I can see this going on and the shift, the momentary shift, it's, um, it's like a shadow or, I mean, it's bigger than us. It's culture is huge, you know, it's like this machine moving, moving, moving. And if you try to fit in with it, forget it. But you do fit in with it. There's no way you can't fit in with it. And you know, you just respond to your life. And your life can't be separate from anything that's going on around you, which includes if you like painting, you know, if you studied it, then you might not even have to think about it for it to come out of your paintings. I, I don't think of, recently there's been some articles that have been like about like my work in relation to color field painting. And frankly, I haven't been thinking about color field painting. But I would never say, oh, color field painting is not in my work because I know it so well as an artist. But you know, I've been, I was actually responding to a very, um, I'm, I'm making a very clunky a analysis, a material analysis of film. You know, but of course all the, the force of, you know, the art, my personal art history is pushing out this product. So I'm not saying in any way that it's ignorant of it. But, you know, it's basically you just have to access, uh, accept that you're in the world, make the work that's interesting to you, because the questions are popping up around you, um, you know, that are, that are the clues. Don't try to follow it, be in it, you know. That's, I think we all are. But not all work is. But, but I think that's what I'm ways. saying. I'm saying that, that, that not all work is. I can, I can see people trying, it's like trying to be popular. <laughs> you know what I mean? it's, it's a great human desire, you know, to be popular. And yeah. I want to bring this back to this curatorial question. Um, for instance, there's the statement has been floating around for a while. Painting is back. Didn't you know painting is back? And it seems clear that that statement. I hear that in '91 too. What's that? I hear that in '91 too. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I say a while. Uh, but I, I don't think it means. Every kind of painting is back. I, uh, I think, in fact, um, in many ways, the painting that's meant by painting is back is an anti-painting, or it's a painting that's flattening out or um, uh, kind of, uh, in a way, humiliating the whole tradition of painting. It's, it's more of a conceptual activity, and, you know, I, I think, for instance, Aaron titling your the recent body paintings with that whole series, what from New American Painters or whatever, and attaching that to um, arbitrary, essentially arbitrary, you know, a reference to arbitrary patterns that that come from a whole different world, is kind of um, you know sucking the projected meaning out of the, the original paintings. It's kind of flattening them. Uh, I want to refer to um, Peter's catalog essay for this abstract painting once removed show. We talked about the, uh, the painters in the show being humi humiliation proof because they're not up on a pedestal. I think, in fact, I, I think that's very true. And I think there's almost an Aikido going on with much of that painting that's almost about humiliating painting. Um, and therefore, you're in a, you're in a very safe position. Uh, one thing I did disagree with in that in that statement was um, about uh, 
They recover the bizarre human affinity for colored substance deliberately arrayed, not as an arrogant ceremonial function, but as an inexhaustible, always potentially thrilling mystery. I think much of the painting is mystery proof also, and probably because it's humiliation proof. I don't know what, you're, what you mean. The humiliation <laughs> thing. I mean, is that right? Not even the humiliation. You think that, you know, believing that you can back, you know, strip the painting? No, I think, he re I think he was reducing pain, but I don't think he was referring to... Yeah, but those, those levels of terminology are so cliche in a way, like saying, like, what it means to really humiliate I mean... I think it's too... You know, I think it's... Too, well, maybe humiliation's a little strong. I think it's to distance yourself. I think, for instance, what you're doing is sort of um, showing how painting is, is made of props and moves. But it's, a, it's a distancing in a way that... that I'm so passionate about painting. But the thing is, like, you are trying to romanticize. I mean, you're bringing that idea that an artist is a romantic monster uh, trying to make a painting, and here they go. No mediatization, just materials, and right there you have it. I'm, I'm not making a value judgment, I'm just trying to be specific I mean, about what's, what's meant by are, painting. Right, but paint, uh, let me just tell you this. I mean, painting always deals with, I, uh, you know, relations between ideas, realization, and material. <coughs> And you know, most of the paintings that I see here, actually, they deal with all of that, too. The, 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 the difference is that, you know, uh, maybe, I mean, my relation, actually, I'm not using, actually, the props or, like, you know, ready-made or things like that, actually. Uh, I really think that those, those materials are actually are alive. I mean, they are, uh, they are uh, like, like living tissue somehow. Like, if I'm making a kind of uh, a pictorial organism, in a way. It's like, I don't know, criticizing uh, that, you know, I don't know, some parts of the good side of techno science, let's say, is, um, I don't know, reactionary because he's fooling around with things that are part of nature and we can touch them in a way. I mean, it's like we, have, we are going to another millennium. I mean, our pra pictorial practices are going to be different than, uh, you know, 19th century and 20th century painting. You know, we are setting up, you know, uh, with a lot of effort, things that are going to be really new. And, uh, you know, this aura, this trying to bring back the aura of what, you know, painting was done before, it's kind of sad, you know, and it's like something that people through the 80s did all that, uh, you know, mourning already. I mean, right now it could look dislocated, it could look uh, artificial, but, you know, culture is like that. Just go hear jungle music, uh, see the culture, see all the micro-political situation, I mean, see the whole culture, you know, point a much more... Uh, different type of culture. It could ne never be like that Unitarian kind of, uh, I don't know, 50s uh, new contact with America thing that you're proposing. I, I, I think also. Am I proposing that? I think we're just, there's two words floating around here that are tr problematic for, I think, everyone. One is vacuum and one is humiliation. It's just a problematic word. It has nothing to do with any of our practices, as far as I can say. Yeah, could you explain humiliation? <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it as a projection. I'm just, I'm just kind of trying to stir the pot. Um, for instance, with, with your painting, um, the kind of understanding of, of a certain kind of abstract painting, say, by the general public, is that the kind of shapes that one might see in your paintings would be romantically associated with the unconscious, driven by the unconscious, um, and therefore, this kind of potent mystery or something. Um, by using these shapes from stains, and you know, stains are really kind of abject things, you know, at least by association. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of waste, accent, and so on. Um, then it really empties out the, the uh, attachment to that projection. Uh, if one believes in painting in that romantic way, which I think probably the general public at least still does, then in a certain way you're really, you're really messing with it, taking that away. Uh, and it's interesting to think of, of your practice having to do with the indexical or diaristic or, you know, a system of language that you created. And I, I certainly believe, believe you when you say that. But your painting, I think, could also be read 
as that kind of position that, in a sense, you know, robs painting of that tra that traditional meaning. Wow, I feel like you're working so hard to make my my work negative. I mean, I don't. Do you really believe that? No, I mean. <laughs> I'm just proposing it as a... But, but you don't believe that, do you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, believe, I believe that the ethos of the time is such that... Um, you? Yeah, no, I'm talking, no, I'm talking about myself. I, I believe that the ethos of, of the time is, is, uh, is a time uh, where being an artist, at, if you're going to get attention, probably... Uh, you're going to take a fairly cool stance. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> tell, tell me you're not. Okay. I'm not. The, Super the, cool. The whole, the whole, the whole <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the, the work is definitely not. I mean, I don't know about me. You know, but the, the work. <laughs> I mean, in a way, I'm, uh, the whole project goes from, from finding something and then uh, constructing and reconstructing. Um, it's a process of reconstruction um, and construction. And, and basically, what it's about how I understand things or how, how I think other people, my conjecture of how we understand things, but it basically comes down to me. So I'm just trying to literalize um, the process of understanding anything, which is from from the, the smallest part to you know the largest whole. How do you have a sense of your body? You know, um, it's through these you know how you look in a mirror, the overall thing, or the you know microscopic. <coughs> okay, I'm not being very clear. <laughs> I just, I just don't think that you, uh, that my project is cool in any way, and it's, that's what I was saying about film is that it's not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not interested in making work that is a critique. If I wanted to critique something, I am a critic, <laughs> you know, and uh, so I'll write that, you know. Um, and in fact, the the question of vacuum also. To me, work that would, you can't negate, I mean, painting of all things is the most material, yeah, you have to, you have to make it. So to be ironic, okay, the word ironic, I had troubles with this in the 80s, I irony. I found, in film school, I found a really good uh, version of irony that I liked, uh, and it, it was in a narrative theory, it's about, uh, I think it's Janae. Uh, but it's, uh, irony is when in a narrative you're above a situation looking down at the characters mm -hmm. and there's a tragedy that they can't escape, okay? Mm -hmm. Now this, this version of irony I could really relate to um, and the other version of irony I, of, that I sort of assumed but never quite had it uh, explained to me in a way that I could understand but got in, the, in the 80s it, it felt very rampant. Um, all, uh, that the work I was seeing was very superior. Now, something that I think is very interesting in all of our works is the different way that we approach point of view, uh, which is, um, so, so in irony, the old, the 80s version that I thought, like, the work was laughing at me, which I hear in your question, I felt um, that the point of view intrinsic to it was that the artist was superior, able to laugh at the viewer, and I always felt rejected by the work I saw. I think, um, Point of view in um, uh, is just a big question. How? Who is the point of view? I mean, I think it was doing good stuff. I'm not dissing 80s art. I'm just saying it was trying to question authority. But in doing that, it was you know the point of view was um, and received of, ideas uh, right, right, sort of like ideas. like um, empowering the self to criti criticize uh, the larger society. But um, you know, I, I, my, my, when my understanding of irony and tragedy sort of um, uh, changed, it also changed my 
perception of some of that work as well. I didn't feel so much outside, you know. So that's my answer is that uh, if anything, I, I mean, I'm part of my work. I'm not pointing a finger at anything. Uh, I'm just trying to understand. I have a big, I have big questions, and I'm trying to make it tangible. My questions. Mm -hmm. I, I think that really came across, and I think it's. I mean, in a way, you're talking about a compassionate point of view. Um, no. <laughs> so another another problematic. You could really just, just, just add in briefly that uh, mm -hmm. painting uh, painting that is a critique of painting is currently uncool. You don't consider your painting that you're doing currently to be a critique like of to painting. Argue against that. <laughs> yes. Because it's uncool, and I don't want to be uncool. <laughs> Wait, now tell me the painting that you're talking about is a critique of painting. No, well, well, I think that I think that my, I think that, insofar as the paintings are sort of self-consciously about trying to understand painting, how it works, how how language or things that are said about paintings work to adjust those, or drawing forth the poetic titles of these paintings and things that that can certainly be read read at least with a certain irony, as as you described in another way, in that point of five. And also as a critique of, the, of that work, though I'm not really thinking of it that way. As you as you say, no one goes to this much trouble to mount a critique. You know, you met. Why can't we think of it in a more complicated way? I mean, our work is all, it's not like Habermas, you know, and it's not like just Heidegger, and it's not just Marx, and it's not just poetics, and it's not just transcendentalism. It's, it's a, every single person's work is a weird hybrid of what they've been interested in, what they're responding to. That's why the, the notion of vacuum is kind of irrelevant because you may be responding to Heidegger, Marx, and your mother. Well, you say the same thing for uh, curatorial ideas? Do you say that curatorial ideas are also complex or do they tend to get simplistic? Well, the problem I have with curatorial practice at the moment is that it admits less for less pure, for less, I hate to open a really bad can of worms, but I mean, there's this sense that I have that um, the way curators are trained is um, heavily textual at the expense of a, of a very clear understanding of the visual um, in a very sophisticated, complex way. What I'm talking about, I'm talking about as a visual phenomenon which is informed by and pressed forward by and, and enriched, but also, you know, not necessarily the same as a textual one. And um, I feel like, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to talk about, you know, I don't really, in, in a way, like, I don't even want to spend the next half an hour talking about curators, because we're not curators. Um, but we're talking about context, we're working within a context. Well, well we, don't, we don't have to. <laughs> well, I think we're working, oh, sorry. Well, hopefully none of us are making work, hopefully, nobody's making work that's just ironic. Hopefully nobody's making work that's just instructive or, you know, some sort of hectoring social factor. Hopefully nobody's making work to get into a show. Um, if they are, maybe they'll get into the show. But, you know. Can I switch, change directions a little bit? Um, would anyone like to talk about pain? And pleasure. I mean, in positive or sort of. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I can, you know, talking about it in this context makes it sort of unpleasurable. It's sort of removing the actual pleasure. Um, I'm doing it like, only. We have like concept of that. What? That they always talk about confidence. Yeah, well, because it's almost it's almost become like there are we're, we're all having this discussion. It seems that are based on these tropes that we all think are true about painting, and so you know. I, I'm having trouble talking about, you know, pleasure in, 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 a, in a context where um, we're talking about humiliation. Uh, <laughs> and you know, all of the words that are going around, it just doesn't work for well, you me. Well, you can talk about pleasure and humiliation, too. Yeah. You can say it all the time. You can say it all the time. All the time. Or something like that. There's also pleasure in critique. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think that the... That the the pleasure, actually, I talk about like, all right, in the studio, okay, I'm in the studio, and hopefully when people come into the studio, they're really not going to um, address the work in the way we have to in a public forum, that you're going to, you know, get a kind of 
hopefully not a call and response, but you know, a response if someone knows your work a little bit. Where I've seen, my view is that for myself, that if people have seen any abstract paintings, they will have an entry into my work. So it doesn't matter to me. You know, I'm not trying to eliminate a response or control it, but I'm relying upon that you know, history of painting culture uh, for that. So if somebody comes in my studio and um, they respond in some way, I mean, I can have pleasure in someone's response, particularly in, a, in an abstract uh, so-called, and this is why I hate to use this, this word again, because it's kind of trouble to into, um, where it is abstract and somebody <coughs> might laugh in front of the painting. You know, and so it's not a, it's not a like whoops. You know, they really kind of like that. There are some works that, have, yeah, I can be you know, It's great. I think it's fine because you know I don't, I don't accept that. You know, my job as a painter to have people not you know to, to eliminate that part of the human experience, even though I'm interested in grids and squares, uh, to eliminate that kind of pleasure that I can connect with the audience. You know, viewer even one on one about. So I like to draw, and to me. To retreat to the studio and draw for like 20 hours in a row is the utmost pleasure. And that's what I do. I think there are different levels of pressure in a way. I think, like, uh, you know, like we're talking about curators in relation to artists. I mean, matching your work with a wonderful curatorial idea brings a lot of pre uh, pleasure. I mean, uh, having that call that somebody actually appreciates what you're doing and put it in the right context is a wonderful pleasure. I mean, being in the, in the studio or actually, like Ingrid actually, that goes around downtown and tracing community gestures actually. I wanted to say that actually. Yeah. I thought it was such a nice uh, thing, the fact that, you know, see a homeless staying there or like a <laughs> fancy thing and you know, all kind of like, kind of new gestures in a way. So, like, we, sometimes we canalize our pleasure in terms of making it, in, in terms of uh, actually even thinking, for instance, now I'm really excited about what I'm doing next, in a way, like when you're about to get a kind of breakthrough, in a way, and sometimes breakthrough is material, in the material level, sometimes it's actually, the breakthrough is actually people, how the people connect to the work, like somebody, you know, we talk about laughter and things like that, I mean, yesterday I was talking with somebody that, that talking about that somebody came to, him, to the museum and saw my work, and then they, 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 this person bring the other friend, and they start laughing together in front of the bees, and start imitating the gestures and movements of, of, of the bees. And I say, wow, that's that kind of theater you can never, you know, come up with. Where you can never think of project making the painting to do that. So that's the, the great thing, the polymorphism, actually, the activities that people do with painting. Oh, uh, I, I, when I went to CalArts, I went to CalArts in New York, and uh, I went because it was a post-studio school. And um, uh, I just wanted to be pushed in another direction. My background was in painting. Anyway, so something I came to really uh, appreciate there was people who were working post-studio and uh, or conceptually. I hate these words are um, arduous, but uh, and uh, something I, I came to really appreciate in what they were doing was um, the invisible, you know, I felt like some people were work, were able to work in their head in this invisible way, and con, you know, conceive of something. And I think uh, I realized that I make things, <laughs> and that uh, that often my ideas aren't my ide ideas that come through making uh, or write, when I write. You know, I have to write a lot to to get to an, to what I'm saying, or uh, that, that there was a pleasure in that, and um, it became not so binary that that. Um, that one was good and one was bad. I think it comes down to what gives you pleasure and what you're good at, you know, and painting gives me a lot of pleasure. And, you know, like, I was in film school, but I didn't like directing people, I, you know, and uh, so I, it limited my options of what kinds of films I could make. Aaron, do you want to talk? Or what about the word fun? And some people have said, Oh, this is a fun show, in, the, in response to some of these people, and I'm sure um, both Amy and Rochelle um, shall also have people enjoying getting pleasure out of their work. I think um, fun. I, I'll, I'll put a, a friend of mine through a friend of mine. Fun is water skiing in a striped bikini. <laughs> that, Water skiing in a striped bikini. That was a friend of mine going to graduate, going to graduate school with. But 
I, when I hear that in regards to, to art painting, this show, I, I want to hear that defined. What, just talk about the, talk about the experience you're having in the show with particular work and uh, in basically elaborate on what you mean by fun because it, usually I think it's, it's more complex than my crude definition. Uh, pleasure, pleasure is better. And that's, for me, you know, that happens in the studio and it's, it's giving me in all sorts of ways, being there, making the paintings, hanging in the studio, is a pleasurable and rewarding experience and you want to sort of transfer that, provide that in some measure. It's, there is this concept that Donna Nelson told me about that some psychological sort of uh, child psychologist um, thing that I don't really know who came up with, but that's called Deep Play. PJ? There's a sort of PJ theory or construct of deep play, which is said to be the state of kids, you know, at deep play where they are fully um, exercising their imaginations, which includes probably their pleasures and their terrors equally, their wit and their, you know, constructs of all kind. And, um, and uh, that state is, is, is also meant to be somehow related to artists at work in their studios, um, or at least I would hope that you know, we would get to that state. I, I, I know I get to it, and I'm sure everybody else does, but um, that state would be limited if you, if, you, if you thought of it as being like, you know, mere, you know, mere fun or something like that, because it would be um, kind of trivialized, obviously. And, and that's why, again, I think it, it requires a real complex um, kind of set of understandings of what deep play means. Do any of you have this experience with deep play? I do. <laughs> I think it's great. The, something else that's really funny is that um, in the studio I have these, uh, I, I don't think you could really see it in the uh, slides, but there's actually three bodies of work that are going on simultaneously. I'll tell you about my play. <laughs> it's um, and it's it's a rigorously structured. I have rigorously structured systems that I work through each body of work, and that um, the systems are one whole thing, and that that like I'm concentrating on getting it right and <coughs> making sure, like with the, the paintings on uh, aluminum. Each stain has to be the color of, it has to be the same color, and each stain has to be a different color. So uh, I'm concentrating, looking at my colored pencil drawing, which uh, uh, delineates, you know, the overlap of these, all these different stains, uh, and I'm trying to sort it out for the painting. And I find that the process of choosing the colors, which is completely free up to me, it's just that it has to be, each thing has to be a different color and all the parts of it have to be the same, um, is, 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 is probably this deep play, this place like that, um, that I actually don't talk about, but that is extremely private and that it, I actually, well, I'll ask this later to Jeremy, but the question of binary color, because for me, I guess color is deep play, that each color is, um, there's not two, but there's, um, the, uh, it's, met, it's like words. Colors are like words, and each color has many associations. So my, my process is only forward. I can only add colors to the picture. I don't ever go back and um, take them out. I only, uh, sometimes I wipe it away and it's the wrong color, and I don't want to make decisions around it, or I'll sand it off, and I'll you know, leave it because the decision is to whatever, and I'll come back and take it off. So it's this, it is a process of growth. Uh, or one idea that I'm trying to make a picture of, and um, the colors just lead me uh, to many, many thoughts. Uh, there's, uh, there's actually the, the problem, you know, of play too, because let's say society in general takes uh, for granted that the art is actually more, it's not like, a, like David Kick is, it's not like a rocket science. So it's like art will play, because let's say if you think that your dog will play with you, you don't want to like that. So you <laughs> professional people. We are professionals of play, right? so like any kind of uh, alternative plays in society, um, we, we always, you know, art is still really mainstream, but it's not how alternative, we, are, we have a little more prestigious uh, than, I don't know, like 
you know, game uh, or, you know, like people in the porno industry or like all kinds of underground kind of activities that people do. So, uh, but, you know, I want to take actually something funny because in my case, I mean, I, I take a pleasure and, uh, at the play that is the specific play of my work, but at the same time, I would like to see people actually uh, bringing some kind of organization. I mean, there is a, a level of play and organization. And uh, I was really happy, actually, I have an, an operation in my knee, actually, and um, I asked the doctor, actually, how did the operation go? And she said, well, we play around with you. <laughs> we play, like, for, for four hours. And I said, what do you mean you play? <laughs> And it was beautiful. He was really making a painting. And I said, well, I thought it was really, I, I, I find it wonderful that, that being a doctor was actually being like an artist too. And, you know, it's like this, this separation between, you know, like what is play and what is actually serious, what is organized, is actually something that I think artists want to have too.